Um, so, so uh, we're nearly at two o'clock, and um, so I, I think we can we can start a minute early. Um, it's a great pleasure to welcome Richard Stanley as our first speaker of the day. Uh, Richard's from MIT. I'm sure you know this already, and. He is going to speak on the X descent set of a permutation. Uh, Richard, is, is everything okay with the co-host function and you can share your slides? Okay, let's, let me try to just do that. Um, okay, thank you. So um, before I begin my talk, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Tofik Mansour for uh, chairing this conference and for all his other work he's done in promoting enumerative combinatorics, uh, especially founding the journal uh, enumerative combinatorics and applications, and for the many uh, fascinating interviews that have appeared in its pages. So I'm going to talk about a generalization of the descent set of a permutation, which I call the X descent set. So I'll remind you uh, what the descent set is, a uh, very standard uh, concept in enumerative combinatorics. Suppose we have a permutation W, A1, A2, AN in the symmetric group Sn, the descent set of W, uh, denoted best W, are the positions I between one and N minus one, where AI is greater than AI plus one. And uh, we would like to you know, understand how many uh, permutations in Sn have a given descent set S. We can, Call this number beta n s. And a good tool for doing this is to find a generating function uh, for this number beta n s. So, in other words, um, we want some kind of uh, algebraic entity y s indexed by subsets of one up to n minus one. For instance, if we're indexing by positive integers, we could use like x to the n, x to the n over n factorial. And here uh, we want something so that we can you know, effect, put it to effective use for looking at the sum over all s, beta n s, y s. And there's different choices for these uh, terms y s, you know, depending on the problem at hand. And the one that works uh, here is uh, Gessel's fundamental quasi-symmetric function, Fs. Um, let me remind you of the definition. It's, it's a power series, uh, homogeneous of degree n and infinitely many variables, x1, x2, et cetera. It's defined to be the sum over all weakly increasing sequences of positive integers, i1 up to i n, uh, except there's a condition on when there's a strict increase, ij is less than ij plus one, j is an s. And then the monomial xi1, xi2 up to xi. Uh -oh. So uh, let's look at an example. Uh, when n equals three, there's a six permutations in S3. And uh, these are, would be the fundamental quasi-symmetric functions, like one, three, two has a descent in the second position. So there's a strict inequality here in the second uh, position. If we add up all of these six uh, power series, well, we turn out that we just get the sum of the Xi's cubed. And that's an elementary, uh, general uh, theorem that uh, uh, we're going to get uh, for uh, Sn, uh, we're going to get the uh, P1 uh, to the n, the first power sum symmetric function or the sum of the Xi's to the nth power. So I'll just try to generalize this to what I call X descent sets we're gonna specify which pairs of elements form a descent. So I'll let the script EN be the set of all pairs IJ, uh, where I and J are between one and N, 
and I does not equal J. An X descent of a permutation W is some index I between one and N minus one for which AI, AI plus one is in X. There may or may not be an ordinary descent. I mean, we could have AI less than AI plus one or AI greater than AI plus one, just as, so long as it's in X. The X descent set, X dash W will be the set of these positions of the X descents. So for example, if X consists of all pairs I, J for which I is greater than J, then the X descent set is just the ordinary descent set. There's ordinary descent, you know, we're counting the pairs, I, we're looking at the pairs, consecutive elements where the one is greater than the first one is greater than the second. So X descent generalized ordinary descents. If we took the extreme case of letting X be all of EN, all possible pairs, then every position I would be an X descent of every permutation. The X descent set of W is one up to N minus one for any W. Okay, uh, well now I've we want to, uh, I say real quick word about symmetric functions. I really am assuming you're familiar with uh, symmetric functions, but I'll just quickly say uh, what I'll be using here. So by a symmetric function, I mean a power series, a bounded degree, with, let's, let's say over the rationals and the infinitely many variables, X1, X2, et cetera, invariant under any permutation of the Xi's, uh, there's various bases for symmetric functions that are most conveniently indexed by partitions of N, which I will write as lambda, an infinite sequence, lambda one, lambda two, et cetera. Weakly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers whose sum is N. Using this uh, notation due to Philip Hall to denote that lambda is a partition of N. So I'm going to be interested here in only two bases for symmetric functions. Well, the main one is going to be the power sum symmetric functions. PK is uh, some of the kth powers of the variables where we set P0 equal to one. And for any partition, lambda, P lambda is P lambda one, P lambda two, et cetera. Well known to be a Q basis for symmetric functions. The second basis, which will only come in a little bit, or the sure functions. I'm not going to define them here. Most of you know what they are. They have, they're a more subtle definition, but they're probably the most important basis for the theory of symmetric functions. Well, we'll take a look at a generating function for the X descent, completely in analogy for what I did with the ordinary descent set. I'll let ux be the sum over all w and sn of the Gessel's fundamental quasi-symmetric function indexed by the x descent set of w. So when you write this as a linear combination of the fs's, the coefficient of fs will be the number of permutations in sn whose x descent set is s. So we're counting permutations according to their um, uh, X descent set. So here's an example, for N equals three, we'll tell, let X be these four uh, allowed descents. So two, one, three, one, three, two, are all the ordinary descents. And we'll also consider one, three to be a descent. There are your six permutations and there corresponding X descent sets. We see three permutations whose X descent set is one, two. Two, one is an X descent and here one, three is an X descent. So uh, the generating function UX is F, there's one empty set here, F empty, F1, F2, and three F1, twos. Well, in general, some Linear combination of quasi-symmetric functions will not be a symmetric function, but here 
it turns out it is a symmetric function. It's this uh, integer combination of power sum symmetric functions. And it's in fact, it's sure positive. It's a positive linear combination of sure functions. So how much of this generalizes of course, this is just one little example. So we have an easy theorem that ux is always a p integral symmetric function. It's always a symmetric function. And when you write it as a linear combination of the power sums, the coefficients are integers. <clears throat> okay, I can quickly say something about uh, how the proof works. I'll try to illustrate it um, by looking at the coefficient of some monomial. Let's say n is seven and m is this monomial x1 squared, x2 cubed, x4 squared. So we'd like to show the coefficient of this monomial in ux is the same as the coefficient of other monomials you get by removing these subscripts. So I remember, I recall the definition of ux, the sum of f of the x indexed by the x descent set of w. There's a definition of fs. So uh, if you think about when will this monomial appear uh, in uh, one of these, well, first, when does it appear in Fs? Uh, in order to have uh, x1 squared, we have to have i1 less than or equal to i2. Well, I, we can't have a greater than sign here because we need xi1 equals xi2 equals x1. So this has to be a less than or equal to sign. That means that the pair A1, A2 should not be an X descent, not an X. And similarly, these other pairs are not an X. So that characterizes what FSs contain this monomial. And of course, coefficient would be one if uh, the monomial appears. Okay, so I've restated this uh, observation. Now we uh, factor our W, um, corresponding to these uh, exponents. Uh, there was an x1 squared, so we factor it after two terms, then an x2 cubed, the next three terms, and then uh, x3 squared, the next two terms, or maybe it was x4 squared. Um, and we have, so this, these two, had to be equal, these three had to be equal. Uh, when we looked at the corresponding term for the quasi-symmetric function, these two equal. And now if we want to, let's say, permute the exponents, uh, so we get x1 cubed, x2 squared rather than x1 squared, x2 cubed, we simply permute the order of these factors. And now we'll have a word w prime for which uh, fs, well, f of the descent, x descent set of w prime will uh, contains this monomial. So generalizing this argument shows ux is a symmetric function. Moreover, what happens when uh, we have equal exponents? Well, then, for instance, if we looked at this factorization here, and interchange u1 and u3, they have the same length. So uh, this gives another permutation that um, in its uh, corresponding quasi-symmetric function contains the same monomial x1 squared, x2 cubed, x4 squared. Different from because we just permute the u1 and u3. So if you generalize this argument, you can see that the coefficient in ux of x1 to the alpha 1, x2 to the alpha 2, et cetera, is an integer multiple of alpha 1 factorial, alpha 2 factorial, et cetera. We can permute the equal exponents and pick up new uh, monomials that contain that, or that are, yeah, that are uh, all appear in uh, ux. And it's well known and uh, uh, easy result that. Uh, yeah, if uh, you look at a linear combination of these monomial symmetric functions, m alpha multiplied by these 
exponents, alpha one factorial, alpha two factorial, etc. Then the resulting symmetric function is actually p integral. So that uh, shows that ux is a p integral symmetric function. And the second easy theorem I want to mention is uh, how ux behaves under the standard linear transformation or actually involution on symmetric functions omega. So as a linear transformation, we can uh, you know, most quickly define it by saying that it's action on P lambda is minus one to the N minus L lambda, the number of parts, positive parts of lambda. L lambda, number of positive parts. So this sign times P lambda. So this extends to all symmetric functions by linearity. This definition here makes it obvious that it's uh, involution. And the theorem is that if you let X bar be the complement of X, the elements of EN that are not in X, then omega of U of X is just U of X bar. So I will leave that as a, exercise uh, due to lack of time, but it's a simple result. Okay, so now let's look at some uh, instances where we can say more about UX than simply that it's a P integral symmetric function. So I'm going to need a definition or concept of the record set of a permutation A1 up to AN. So we'll define rec W to be the set of all I between zero and N minus one, such that AI is greater than AJ for all J less than I. So you're reading W from left to right, and you look at the positions where you find the element larger than all the previous ones. So like a new record uh, for being the largest element. In particular, uh, when I equals zero, uh, we get that zero is an element of the record set of W. The record partition of W, well, uh, our P of W is a partition that uh, records the differences between the elements in the record set. So the elements R1 minus R0, R2 minus R1, et cetera, arranged in decreasing order so that they form a partition. So let me state this theorem that I had conjecture and was later proved by Ira Gessel. Suppose X has the property that every descent is an ordinary descent. That is if I, J is an X and I is greater than J. Then there's a very nice combinatorial interpretation of the expansion of UX in terms of power sums. In particular, the coefficients are positive. We sum over all permutations in SN whose X descent set is empty. And then P, the power sum symmetric function indexed by the record partition of W. Here is an example. X is two, one, three, two, four, three. So that satisfies the hypothesis i greater than j for all i j, for all i j and x. So there are 11 permutations of one up to four whose record partition is, I mean, whose uh, x descent set is empty. Those are these. I've both highlighted in blue the positions of the records. So, you know, there's always a record at the beginning, but here, as we lead, read from left to right, three is a new record and four is a new record. And we just look at the difference between uh, the uh, consecutive elements. Uh, uh, we're thinking of a five at the end, or it's a fifth position at the end. So here the differences are one, 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 one. Etc. So these are the record set, uh, record partitions. 
you know, these are not good. Now I, call it, I should have called these record partitions, not the record set. And therefore, ux is p1 to the fourth, 3p2, p1 squared, because there's three, two, one, ones here, et cetera. So a very elegant uh, commentary interpretation of the expansion in power sums. Now, uh, Dari Grinberg has generalized this. He has shown that if uh, X is the property that when I, J is an X and J, I is not an X, then U, X is still P positive. And he has a combinatorial interpretation of the coefficients, but it's somewhat more complicated and I will uh, not give it here. But I should say it's not true in general that the coefficients of uh, U, X are P positive. Well, in fact, you can see it from here because if we apply omega to U, well, if, remember, if we apply omega to UX, you get UX bar. But omega applied to P2, P1 squared is minus P2, P1 squared. So we're going to get a minus sign if we replace X by X bar here. Oh, uh, just mention for those who are fans of chromatic symmetric functions that these uh, UXs include an important class of chromatic symmetric functions. Let P be a partial ordering of one up to N. And we're gonna take YP to be uh, this set of all comparable pairs in P, all pairs I, J, such that I is greater than J in the post set P. Inc P is the incomparability graph of P. So it's a vertex set is one up to N, the elements of P. And there's an edge I, J, if I and J are incomparable in P. I is not less than J and I is not greater than J. <clears throat> X, G will be the chromatic symmetric function of G. Well, I won't define it here, but it's some symmetric function generalization of the chromatic polynomial. And the theorem, which is very easy to prove just directly from the definitions, is that this generating function u, if we, we're taking yp now to be x, or a set of uh, x descents, is the uh, chromatic symmetric function of the incomparability graph of P. I think there should be an omega here. Oh, the automorphism omega applied to the incomparability graph of P. Well, now let's turn to a class of permutations uh, that uh, we can well, very, very nicely with respect to the, well, a class of X descent sets that will behave very nicely. Um, namely, we'll just let X be pairs of consecutive integers, one, two, two, three, up to N minus one, N. These pairs, well, in the literature and these kinds of permutations are called successions. Let Fn be the number of permutations in this Sn whose x descent set is W. These are called succession free, uh, whose x descent set is empty. These are called succession free permutations. Permutations for which you never have i followed by i plus one. Uh, it's a known result that generating function for the succession free permutations is just given by either the minus x over one minus x squared. Something, something like derangement. For derangement, the generating function would be either the minus x over one minus x. And so here's a nice theorem 
for how to expand UX in terms of uh, sure functions. In general, uh, it's quite rare for UX to be sure positive. Even in these theorems about P positivity, uh, the rarely uh, UX will rarely be sure positive. But here's an example of sure positivity. There's a very explicit uh, expansion in terms of sure functions. First, only the sure functions of hook shape appear. First row of length i and all the other rows of length one. And the coefficient is just fi, the number of succession-free permutations in si. So this is essentially is the this is the generating function for permutations in SM by their succession set, position of their successions. I can say, well, here's what it looks like, for example, for n equals four. There's four hook shapes, uh, most one part not equal to one. F3 is 11, F2 is three, F1 is one, and F zero is one. The empty partition, succession free. Okay, so let's me indicate, how do you prove uh, this theorem? Well, I'll uh, look at this for any S subset of N minus one, I'll take the coefficient of fs on uh, both sides uh, of this uh, equality that we want to prove. So the left-hand side, I mean, by the definition of ux, is gonna be the number of permutations in Sn whose x to sense set is s. Now for the right-hand side, and what makes this uh, work out so nicely is that uh, these, uh, when you expand the hook sure functions in terms of quasi-symmetrics, their supports are disjoint. A set S, any set S appears in exactly one of them. Now namely, uh, SI one to the N minus I is the sum of those FSs where S has N minus I elements. So uh, if we're trying to pick out the coefficient of fs from this sure function, si n minus i, well, if s has n minus i elements, the coefficient will be one, otherwise zero. So what we need to show uh, to establish this is simply that fi is the number of permutations in sn whose x to sense set is s when s has n minus i elements. So we need some kind of bijection. Okay, so here's what we want to show. So I'll show this by a bijection. Permutations uh, in X, Sn, whose X to sense set is S, well, where S has N minus I elements, and permutations in Si, X to sense set is empty. So just a pure permutation enumeration problem. And I'll illustrate it with an example. It's actually a very simple bijection. Let's take this permutation. S is one, four, two. Those are the positions of the successions. In the first position, there's five, six. In the fourth, one, two, and two, three. Of course, N is seven. I is uh, four. The cardinality of S is N minus I, which is three. So we factor W according to uh, the length, well, the factors are that are the longest possible factors of consecutive integers. So in other words, we factor it after the uh, non-succession. So we have five, six, and four, and one, two, three, and then seven. Then we simply replace the smallest factor of the smallest integers here, one, two, three, by one. And the next smallest, four by two, five, six by three, and then the largest by four. And we'll get a permutation three, two, one, four. And that is the U. That is the permutation in S4 with no 
successions. It's very easy to check that this bijection is correct. So that's the proof of uh, the expansion of UX in terms of shear functions. There's a Q analog. I can mention it. The proof is more or less the same. You just have to keep track of the exponent of Q, just straightforward. Now it turns out the correct sort of a power of Q to put in here, you get a nice Q analog. You know, if Q were one, we would just be getting UX. There's the number of ascents of W inverse. At least that's the correct Q analog for this particular set X. Uh, in general, well, the Q analogs are pretty subtle. And most of the time, there is no nice Q analog. You're not going to get a symmetric function. But here with this definition, if we let uh, FNQ be the generating function of permutations in SN whose X ascent set is empty according to their ascent, number of ascents of W inverse, if Q is one, we just get back to my FN, the number of such permutations with X descent set empty. Then uh, UX sub Q, it's Q analog of UX. This is very straightforward. Q analog of UX. FI gets replaced by FIQ here. And there's this extra factor Q to the N minus I. All right, now I'll turn to a somewhat different uh, topic associated with X ascent set, which we get by regarding uh, X as a digraph, a directed graph, and look at some digraph concepts that are um, we can associate with X, especially Hamiltonian paths. So if we have I, J, and X, uh, we regard this as an edge, a directed edge from I to J. So the vertices of the digraph are one up to n. So a Hamiltonian path in uh, X, regard it as a digraph, or we can think of it as a permutation, A1 up to An and Sn, such that the successive pairs of successive elements uh, are uh, in X, right? Because to say it's an X, means there's an edge from AI to AI plus one. So we have an edge from A1 to A2, A2 to A3, all the way up to AN. That's a Hamiltonian path, a directed path that goes through all the vertices with no repeated vertices. Ham X would be the number of Hamiltonian paths in X. So repeating this, uh, well, it's essentially immediate from this definition, almost a restatement of this definition, is that a permutation in SN is a Hamiltonian path in X, if and only if it's X to sunset is all of one up to N minus one. That's just a particular coefficient in the expansion of UX in terms of uh, quasi symmetric, fundamental quasi symmetric functions. And by applying omega, we got that omega W is a Hamiltonian path in the complement of X, if and only if its X to sense set is empty. So there's some research that's been done coming to a couple of results con connected with a Hamiltonian paths, with a connection between Hamiltonian paths and the digraph X in this complement. And we can see here that that and lifts up to the uh, automorphism omega on symmetric functions. So first, how to read directly off from UX, rather than just the expansion in terms of quasi-symmetric functions. Uh, 
the number of Hamiltonian paths, let's say in X complement. We expand it in terms of power sums. And then the number of Hamiltonian paths in X complement is just the sum of the coefficients. Really immediate from the definition. So ux was the sum of f of the x descent set of w. Remember, w is a Hamiltonian path in the complement if and only if its x descent set is empty. So the number of Hamiltonian paths in the complement is the number of w and sn whose x descent set is empty. You mentioned that on the previous slide. What about now let's take the coefficient of x1 to the n on both sides here. The coefficient of x1 to the n in fs is one if s is empty. It's zero otherwise because in this definition, i1 less than or equal to i2 less than or equal to i3, et cetera, we have to allow all of these signs to be equalities. And that means s has to be empty in order to get an x1 to the n. Also, if you look, think of the definition of power sums, the coefficient of x1 to the n in the power sum symmetric function p lambda is one. So when we take the coefficient of x1 to the n on both sides, we're gonna get uh, uh, this uh, formula. We're gonna get uh, uh, the number of Hamiltonian, here we'll get the sum of the C lambdas. We get a one for every P lambda. And here we'll get the number of Hamiltonian paths in the complement. So that's the proof. Well, in the media corollary, what we just get by applying omega is that if we want the number of Hamiltonian paths in X rather than X complement, we just take the sum of C lambda multiplied by the sine, which uh, is in the theory of symmetric functions is denoted epsilon lambda, but minus one to the n minus L lambda. That you'd simply get by applying omega to this previous theorem and using its op action on ux and on uh, p lambda. Okay, what can we do with this? Well, uh, Cloud Bearers uh, has a theorem uh, that uh, for any digraph X on one up to N, the number of Hamiltonian paths in X is congruent to the number in X bar mod two. So Bearers use a kind of uh, inclusion exclusion type argument. It falls immediately out of uh, theory that I've just developed as observed by Dari. So if a ux is the sum of c lambda p lambda, and remember these c lambdas are all integers, this sum here is the number of Hamiltonian paths in uh, x complement, and the sum of the c lambda, I know in x, and the sum of the c lambdas, the number of Hamiltonian paths in x complement, we have to show they're congruent mod two, of course, it's trivial because the signs can't go to one mod two. So that's the very elegant proof of Barry. Now there's a class of, uh, another class of uh, X that uh, has, for which UX has some nice special properties. And these are tournaments. So recall that a digraph X, let's say on the vertex set, one up to N is a tournament. If for all I less than J, exactly one of IJ is an X or JI is an X. And notice that the uh, complement X bar of a tournament is also a tournament. So Dari has a, Nice formula, combinatorial formula for the expansion of UX in terms of power sums when X is a tournament. Um, it's very different 
from the expansion I mentioned uh, before, we're using record sets. It may be, be interesting to see when we no, the, 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 the other theorem applies to tournaments only when we have a, a acyclic tournament for which everything becomes very simple. But anyways, this is Dari's uh, formula. Uh, Ux is the sum over all W, P of the, this is the row W is the cycle type of the uh, permutation W, the, partition that tells you the lengths of the cycles in the disjoint cycle decomposition of W. And we have this exponent, which is a power of two. NSC stands for non-singleton cycles of W. So W ranges over all permutations less than odd order. So already all the cycle lengths have to be odd. Such that, oh yeah. So that every non-singleton cycle of W is a directed cycle of my digraph X. And NSCW is a number of the non-singleton cycles of W. So already we get the surprising result that only the odd power sums appear here because only, we are summing over only permutations of odd order and all those cycle lengths are odd. Now, Dari actually has a formula of this nature for any X, not just tournaments, but it's more complicated and it's going to have signs in it because, you know, coefficient is not always a positive the arbitrary X. So I, I won't state it here. So we see this co corollary that if X is a tournament, the new X is uh, uh, integer combination, in fact, a non-negative integer combination of, well, not simply the odd power sums, but the uh, P1, the power sums except for P1 get multiplied by two, the polynomial in P1, 2P3, 2P5, 2P7, et cetera. Because, uh, well, the permutation is the identity here, that's the only way we're going to get a P1 to the N term, all cycles of length one. Every other term is gonna contain some PI where I is greater than one. So it's the number of these uh, non-singleton cycles has to be at least one. So we're going to get a power of two, a factor of two for every one of these non-singleton cycles. So we're going to get a polynomial in P1, 2P3, 2P5, 2P7, et cetera. Well, as an aside, uh, when we have a symmetric function that's a polynomial in the odd power sums, then it can be written uniquely as a linear combination of sure so-called shifted sure functions, capital P lambda. Lambda has distinct parts. So can anything worthwhile be said about the coefficients when you expand the UX in terms of these capital P lambdas? I mean, the coefficients need not be uh, positive. So uh, can't be can't be a too simple common term interpretation. And here is an example illustrating uh, this theorem of Dari. This is my digraph. These are the edges. Well, it's a tournament. This is a tournament, actually. You see, it has this unique odd cycle one to two to four to, to one. So we want the, oh, no, no, it's not the unique. There's one other odd cycle, one, three four to one, the two odd cycles. So we want all permutations whose non-singleton cycles are an odd cycle of this digraph. So the non-singleton cycles have either one, two, four, or one, three, four. There's three such permutations. 
the term we get, well, we just the power some symmetric function corresponding to the cycle type. So we get P3, P1 for these cycles of length three and one, and then two to the number of these non-singleton cycles is one of them uh, in each case. So Ux is P1 to the fourth, just add all these up plus four, P3, P1. In terms of these sure, shifted shear sure functions, remember the indices now are partitions into distinct parts, five P4 minus two P3. So this is, I'm asking that there's some nice significance to these coefficients five and minus two. Well, there's a graph theoretic application to um, this uh, formula of uh, Bari. Um, well, I've repeated now uh, the formula for the number of Hamiltonian paths in X uh, in terms of the expansion of UX in terms of power sums. And X is a tournament. And the theorem or how we expand UX in terms of uh, power sums. So we immediately read off from this um, by uh, taking the uh, coefficient of X1 to the N on both sides, exactly like we did uh, uh, before. We'll get the number of Hamiltonian paths in X. That's the coefficient of uh, let's see, did I mean X or X bar? Yeah, I meant probably the number of Hamiltonian paths in X bar. Of course, it doesn't matter because we can just replace X by X bar. But it's the sum over all W two to the number of non singleton cycles in W. We're just taking the coefficient of X1 to the N on both sides here. So, an interesting new formula for the number of Hamiltonian paths in a diagram. Now, for all uh, in this uh, expansion here, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, for any X, when you explain it in terms of P lambda, C lambda is gonna be, uh, when lambda is one to the N, that is when we're looking at the coefficient of P one to the N, this coefficient is gonna be one. which you can see, for instance, by just considering uh, the expansion of UX in terms of fundamental quasi-symmetric functions and taking the coefficient of P1 to the N on both sides. So when we go back to uh, this uh, formula for the number of Hamiltonian paths in X, the C1 to the N, lambda is one to the N, all parts equal to one, we're going to get a one here. But all the other terms are going to be even because uh, they're going to correspond to permutations with at least one cycle, odd cycle of length greater than one. So we've written this formula, ham x, as one term equal to one, and w is the identity, all the other terms are even. And so we get the formula of Red A from 1934. Every tournament has an odd number of Hamiltonian paths. This number is odd. One term equals one, and all the other terms are even. So another uh, 
nice application uh, of this uh, symmetric function theory in X to sensets to uh, graph theory. I wonder what, if anything else can be said about, um, you know, the common torques of tournaments using this theory. Um, but I haven't gotten anywhere. I mean, I looked at the conjecture of low VOS. It's still open. Every vertex transitive undirected graph as a Hamiltonian path. You know, to look at Hamiltonian paths and undirected graphs, we just have to look at X's, such as if IJ is an X, then also J I is an X. So we can get undirected graphs into the picture. The hard part is getting the hypothesis of vertex transitivity uh, into the story. I, but maybe somebody can do something there. Okay, so. Uh, I will end here. Thank you for listening. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for a very nice talk, Richard. Um, are there any people who might have any questions, please? So I have a question. Okay. As we see, this statistic is very special here. Did you try another statistic, like measure index, if it's working? Measuring what? Index, measure index. That the sum of the positions of the 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 descents. Oh yes. Um, I mean, I did fool around with a few others, but I didn't really uh, get anywhere. But yeah, this sub. I mean, for instance, what about some nice QT analog? Well, even in general, Q analogs are not very nicely. Behave much less QT analogs, but yeah, special cases. You know the so-called Stanley Stembridge uh, conjecture um, on chromatic symmetric functions. The graphs that that applies to those are special cases of these U axes. You could try to, um, and then. Uh, Shiroshin and Wax have a Q analog there. So you could have tried to apply that. Uh -huh, I see. That fits into this UX theory in some nice way that so you can make further progress. But I didn't see what you could do with it. Thanks. Any further questions? Yeah, quick question. Can you extend this beautiful theory to words or at least for with a fixed, uh, the same number, for example, one, one, two, two, and n, and et cetera? Um, yes, you can do quite a bit. Um, OK. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think you still are going to get um, Rather than looking at permutations of a set, you can just look at permutations of a multi-set. And you can also allow, now we can allow descents when the two elements are equal, you know, with extra feature. I think it's still a P-positive uh, symmetric function, or, or, or maybe it's a symmetric function, it wasn't P-positive. I don't remember there. I only looked at that a little bit, but definitely uh, you, sh you can say something and it deserves some further investigation. Uh, good question. Thank you. Okay, if the uh, is somebody uh, this is Bill Chen. Yeah, hi. Hi. Can you tell us something about your point of departure to consider the X extension? Uh, I guess it was just looking at the uh, the Stanley Stembridge uh, conjecture, which I think about from time to time. Uh, um, 
you know, I realize one way of formulating it would be in terms of these X descents or certain X. So that gave me the idea of looking at any X. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, I think we'll leave questions there. Um, but if anyone else has further questions, perhaps they could get in touch with Richard uh, privately. So uh, thanks once again, Richard, and we'll have a short break of five minutes until the next speaker. <laughs>